Okay, welcome ladies and gentlemen to Room for Discussion. Today we have the honor to host an interview with uh, the former leader of the PvdA or the Dutch Labour Party for uh, the internationals. Uh, but a lot has changed. Uh, he moved on to European politics and today he is the head of the cabinet of Frans Timmermans. And of course, he is the architect of the new European New Green Deal. Um, so today we will not talk about politics, Dutch politics, but more focus on European politics and climate change. Right, Floyd? Yeah, might depend on the answers, right? Yeah, that's a little true. bit. <laughs> um, okay, please well. give a warm applause for Mr. Diederik Samson. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> Mr. Samson, please have a seat. Good afternoon. Hello. Good afternoon. Let me start off by saying that we are uh, delighted that we uh, have you here on, uh, on this stage. Um, it must be a busy period for you, we assume. Sort of, yeah. Sort of. <laughs> well, we thought it was a busy period because there is a Glasgow uh, conference right now, and we thought, well, you might be involved in that. Yeah, but I'm here. Now. Yeah, that's, so that's uh, <laughs> no, the first week of an uh, of international uh, COP, uh, uh, conference of the parties, is always the technical part yeah. uh, where most of the technical agenda is trying uh, to be dealt with. Yeah. Um, normally at the end of the week there's some issues left and then the ministerial segment starts and that's where Frans Timmermans come in, comes in and the last I will join him. The last 30 minutes matter. More yeah, the last, <laughs> well basically the last week and then the last two days of the week and then the yeah. last day and mo most of the time it's actually the day after the last day because yeah. we always run over time. Yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's true. What do you expect to be the most significant outcome of the conference? <laughs> Well, I, uh, I, the, the overall goal of Glasgow is, and uh, it's carefully worded, to keep the one and a half degrees alive. Yeah. Uh, so it's not worded like to meet the one and a half degrees commitment, which would actually be yeah. mm -hmm. the, the real goal, but yeah. we already know that that won't happen. So um, as experienced politicians, you always reformulate your goal to get a success in the end. You have to be careful with that, because otherwise you lose your credibility. Yeah. So it, it is, at the moment, uh, we need to keep the one and a half degrees alive. Um, and I can already sort of predict, you can laugh at me uh, afterwards, obviously, if this is not uh, going to be uh, the case, but I think we will be successful in doing that. Yeah. Um, that well, shouldn't be uh, the end of the story, as far as I'm concerned, because next year <laughs> there's another COP, 27, mm -hmm. uh, in Egypt. Sheikh. Well, bef before we go there, is ah. it, uh, because sorry. Uh, yeah, sorry, you steered the, the yeah. Conversation. Uh, well, I was I was wondering. I mean, w is that disappointing you that that already the formulation of the one and a half degrees is, is or is there something else? I'm not trying to be pessimistic, but that already disappointed you. Um, no, at uh, the start of the conference, uh, it, it disappoints. Obviously, yeah. uh, we we should have delivered on on one and a half degree. Uh, actually, last year. Yeah. Uh, or yeah. well, there wasn't a conference last year. Uh, so we had an extra year, and we should have used that better. Yeah. That's, that's the, uh, the, the sad conclusion. Mm -hmm. yeah. the, the optimistic part of the conclusion is that we still stand a chance. Yeah. Uh, we still have the option to deliver on this commitment. Uh, we should have done that earlier, but we can still do it. Yeah, there was also something that disappointed us, and it was this week when I read the NRC, and they stated that uh, the Dutch government will not sign the support to end the new... Uh, to end public uh, direct, yeah, the public support for the international unabated fossil fuels yeah. uh, energy by that. 2022. Yeah. Isn't it also frustrating you? Mm, it's, it's, it's more in the margins of, of such a conference. It's obviously a bad signal that the Dutch government ha doesn't have the courage to come forward mm -hmm. and sign that. And, and with the reason that they are the missionary cabinet. Yeah, that's, that's an easy excuse. It's <laughs> an easy one, right? <laughs> yeah. No, that's too easy because there's many, many governments also in, uh, at the moment, Portugal doesn't have a government either and they yeah. signed. To exactly. Be yeah. So there's no, uh, that's not a, not a real valid excuse. Mm -hmm. Uh, they can still make up for it, by the way, because uh, as we speak here, uh, my phone is, is ringing, uh, because <laughs> what normally happens, the European Commission can also sign such a, such a declaration. Mm -hmm. But the European Commission has, uh, can only sign if 27 member states agree with that. One yeah. of them is the Netherlands. Yeah. At the moment, we have a sort of a written procedure to get that done fast, because otherwise we have to wait, the, wait a month for the next European Council. So we do that fast. So the Netherlands could agree today 
uh, to have the European Commission sign on behalf of everyone in Europe, All right, which would actually be the best way forward. Yeah, of course, but isn't it then also a signal that they place the interest in their interest in, in big companies like Shell on a higher agenda than uh, changing of to, uh, fighting to me, climate to be honest, change? Uh, that might play a role, but I think there's a more uh, mundane reason. Uh, they just didn't pay attention. Didn't pay attention. <laughs> they just missed this. Okay. So uh, sometimes well, that, that's reasons sad. also that's very sad to see. <laughs> it's it's uh, a lot in politics yeah. happens uh, uh, in the same way things happen in normal life. Well, they're yeah. humans. We would think, right? Yeah. As well, they're so. they're humans, and and the Dutch delegation might not have seen this coming. Uh, uh, called too late to uh, the capital, Den Haag in this case, uh, and they they didn't couldn't make up their mind. Things like this have to go fast. Mm -hmm. Uh, etc. And the final so thing on, on Glasgow, is there something for the, the 2030, 2050 goals that you're really hoping still to, to see? Is there something well, we on were, your list? Uh, we had a Gassamer plan, a sophisticated strategy to get India on board, and that worked. Yeah. And I, I can tell you that India makes a hell of a difference um, it, with 1.3 billion inhabitants. Exactly, quite some people. Uh, so yeah. they came forward in the first, first two days, actually a few days ago, with their commitment to be climate neutral in 2017. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. uh, to z uh, 70. <laughs> yeah. You might say that's too late, but yeah. for a developing country like India, it's actually uh, spot on. They didn't exactly uh, lay out the trajectory, so they could, e they could still go up big time and then go down with their emissions, mm -hmm. but they made a few additional pledges on renewable energy, 500 gigawatts, of renewable energy, that is an incredible. Like yeah. That's an incredible amount, I can tell you. Um, uh, by 2:30, uh, so if Dutch companies want to earn some money, go to India. Um, so a few other pledges, and that brings us, as as a world, on a trajectory uh, that is now calculated by loads of think tanks and also scientific um, oh. institutions. Uh, 1.9 degrees. So, but so 1.9. So we we are now at 1.9. If we if we would have a sort of a, a tracker, uh, <laughs> we started the conference at 2.7. We're now at 1.9. Yeah. You can see India makes all the difference. Yeah. Uh, Bhutan also made a pledge, but, but, but that's China. So, China so you're happy that you're happy that India is on board. That's yeah, yeah. That was, that was we we worked, and that's pretty difficult okay. with India because they don't tend to listen uh, to Europe that much. They mm -hmm. think they are world power. And they sort they, of are. Yeah. Uh, okay. So we had. Uh, it took us a l quite a long, uh, a long journey since uh, we worked on that for one and a half years. Okay. Uh, yeah. Before we move on to a more in-depth uh, questions um, regarding the European Green Deal, we will. Yeah, we wanted to know the, uh, the person Dirk Samson a little bit better. So ah. we have a little rapid fire for you. Okay. Yeah. Excited? Yes. <laughs> okay. So I will start, and it's bring uh, it on. The first one: Mark Rutte or Ursula von der Leyen? <laughs> Mark Rutte. Uh, being a PvdA leader or being a cabinet chef of Frans Timmermans? Being cabinet chef of Frans Timmermans. Okay, we will. Yeah, <laughs> we, okay, let's, let's move on. Uh, red or green? Green. Green. Okay. Wind or solar? Solar. Okay, fit for 55 in 2030 or uh, climate neutral in 2050? Fit for 55 in 2030. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and your last one? <laughs> my last one, the most important one, honest yeah. answer, Timmermans with or without beard. <laughs> without. Without. Yeah. I, I agree, fully agree. I, I tell him every day. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Midlife <laughs> crisis, whatever, I don't know. It's there. Okay. <laughs> but uh, being a PvdA leader or being cabinet chef of Franz Timmermans, then, yeah. you're, then we'll, you will go to... Yeah, I, I never imagined that I would take up my life, go to Brussels, mm -hmm. Uh, but this project is amazing, yeah. um, and the advantage of Brussels compared to Den Haag in terms of political mayhem is if you make a mistake in Den Haag in the morning, and I made a lot of them, <laughs> you, you sometimes wonder whether you even make it into the evening. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, there's so much... Uh, Focus. Op ...ophef, as we call it, upheaval and yeah. mayhem and... Uh, and actually, at the end of the day, everybody is at the same place, back at the same place, so nothing's yeah. moved forward. But still, there's a lot of um, um, emotion there. And in Brussels, it's 
not all, but most of it is about substance. Yeah. Uh, it's quiet, maybe a bit too quiet even mm. in terms of transparency, pl public scrutiny, etc. Yeah. Political games, if they are played, they're played and, at, at third, league, uh, third league level, so uh, nothing to bother about. And you can just do what, whatever you want. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can make a difference. Bigger than, uh, you can make a bigger difference in, your, uh, in Brussels than you can make in Den Haag. It's a bit dependent on the subject, obviously. Yeah. But for climate, it's, it's uh, absolutely it's, yeah. clear. Um, well, of course, you are doing the Green Deal in, in Europe. Um, it might be that there are well, there are quite some people uh, that there are very enthusiastic students but never heard of the, of the Green Deal. Could be. So before we lose Still them... Still possible. Yeah. Uh, could you quickly, just and as simply as possible, explain what the, what the Green Deal is all about? Just short. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a plan to put Europe and with Europe the rest of the world all, uh, on a trajectory towards a sustainable future. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, that's, that's the idea, pretty simple. Yeah. Um, and that's more than climate only. Uh, because one, one, once we started uh, in, in Brussels, in the summer of 2019, I, I went to, to Brussels as a volunteer because I could only start my job when the man, new mandate of the Commission started in December. But we started uh, preparations for it uh, in the summer. And actually, the, the summer between two mandates of a European Commission is the best possible time frame uh, window of opportunity to yeah. make a difference. Mm -hmm. It's like a formation in, in, uh, in, in, in a Dutch government. You have that ability to do everything from a white sheet of paper and start all over again. Yeah. And we started to design that plan to put Europe on a trajectory towards a sustainable future. And for once, we didn't have to settle for the lowest common denominator the, the political compromise. We could just write down what was needed in terms of environmental urgency. Mm -hmm. So that's not only about climate. Uh, obviously, it's a, an important part, uh, and hence the, net, uh, the uh, climate neutrality goal via minus 55 in 2030, but also to stop the loss of biodiversity. Because if you could compare apples to oranges, and you shouldn't, because you can't, but if, you'd, if you could, uh, you could argue that the loss of biodiversity is an even bigger threat to future generations than climate change. Mm -hmm. um, and the third goal is to stop pollution altogether. Yeah. So to and, stop and polluting our water, our soil, our air completely. And while, while drafting these uh, new Green Deal, were there any concessions you have rather not have made? Well, uh, not at that moment, no. obviously. During the Every, explain everything that you wanted was is, is inserted in at uh, that in moment video. we could write a lot everything we wanted down. When you think it's an incredible experience for somebody uh, who's worked in public office for a while mm -hmm. because it's normally you can't it's not be just because you sneakily make use of this momentum or this time frame it's also because the outside world was asking for it and what you said when well, the concession later on they came some what's the one that's top on mind that maybe keeps you awake at night still a little bit <laughs> no 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 nothing keeps me awake at night but uh, obviously uh, if you have to name one the, um well no no there's a, too many to mention but uh, well, then one of them <laughs> No, uh, for instance, the, um, uh, we have a target for zero emission cars. Um, and if you would really go, uh, well, jump out of your socks or go out of your mind and think, okay, what is, what is the most ambitious time frame that we can take for that? It's 2030. So uh, the, the funeral of the internal combustion engine, we organized that on the 1st of January 2030. We couldn't make that happen. Because of, well, Europe is still a car economy. Eh? Mm -hmm. uh, if it, it, actually, our whole economy is, 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 is about cars. Depends, yeah. if, if people stop buying cars, our economy goes down. If they start buying cars, it's great. Yeah. And everything else is, is noise. Uh, so it's quite a, an important part of our economy, part, mm -hmm. quite an important sector. They wanted to uh, get rid of this funeral altogether, yeah. obviously. Mm -hmm. And we managed to settle down at 2035. Yeah, we will move on to electric, uh, the electric mobility in, in a few, but ah, okay. first of all, um, we would like to give uh, some room for um, discussion from uh, the audience. Are so there any... Oops, that's quick. I see someone here really wants to uh, be first. That's we compli have a mic? completely fine. <laughs> Is there a mic? <laughs> that, that would, would be, be great. <laughs> or you have to shout. <laughs> No, 
Thank you. Hi, should I send up or? Yes. Uh, hi there. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for being here. First of all, I want to mention that one and a half degrees is not going to be reached. Um, so, <laughs> just so optimistic you know. start of this. Just so <laughs> they were all on the same page. Uh, and actually, as a European climate ambassador, I took the initiative to design a course on sustainable finance, which I want to make mandatory at this university next year. So I'm actually quite interested in your view on uh, yeah, the role of education, especially on sustainable finance. And um, Only one question. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> well, let's start, yeah, let's start like that, and then maybe if you could explain a little bit on, um, yeah, what you think about how climate finance targets can be met and raised. Thank you very much. Um, uh, to answer your first part, uh, uh, your first statement that we will not meet the one and a half degrees, I, I disagree with you, um, because I think we will. Uh, not yet, as I, as I explained, not at Glasgow. Uh, but in Egypt, uh, I, I think we have a possibility because the other big player, bigger than India, is obviously China. And uh, to, be, to, to simplify the whole issue, it's all about China. Uh, if China comes forward with an NDC, a nationally determined contribution, which is their pledge for 2030, yeah. if they come forward with a pledge that is uh, sufficient, we will make it. If they don't, we won't make it. Nobody else can make up for the, for the gap that China creates. In, in finance, it's actually pretty simple uh, the other way. It's the U.S. If the U.S. pays up its fair share, we, because we, as a world, we agreed with each other 10 years ago that uh, the developing countries will receive 100 billion euros per year. So it's actually the biggest uh, transfer from rich to poor uh, in the history of mankind. But still, 100 billion per year, and we, we, we didn't make that yet embarrassing uh, uh, to be ashamed of as, developing, as developed world. Uh, the difference is the US. If they pay their fair share, we make it. If they don't, nobody else can make up for that. For the one and a half degrees, China is contemplating its pledge. Uh, obviously, at their own timing, at their own stage, at their own conditions, nobody can tell China what to do. We try every day. Uh, uh, so uh, we nudge them into the right direction, uh, we think. Uh, and it might well be that they come forward with plans for their electricity sector and their industry, which are the two main players in terms of their CO2 emissions, mm -hmm. that deliver a, a, a CO2 reduction of about 12 gigatons, and 12 gigatons is the whole emissions of the EU, by the way. So they, they, uh, if they do that, we make it. If they don't, we won't. Uh, sometimes life is pretty simple. On the role of education, that's maybe something we overlooked in our uh, overall Green Deal plan. Uh, and I have to admit that we could have done a better job. One of the reasons is obviously that Brussels doesn't, doesn't have anything to say about education. So if it's not on your turf, you tend to forget about it, oh, which mm -hmm. is not a good idea, but it happens. But now I can make up for that in this, uh, <laughs> in this, uh, because of your question. I think the single biggest contribution that you can make towards a sustainable future is education. I've I was wrong almost all my life. I thought, always thought that the biggest contribution you can make to a sustainable future is to put up a windmill but then it's quite or a solar panel. Then it's quite a pity if you say that you overlooked it yeah, and it's well, also the single biggest thing uh, that you... For the sake of uh, argument. <laughs> I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. But it's still happening. Uh, luckily, Brussels is not the only one steering the world. Okay. So countries are still investing in education and they should do a little more uh, if possible. But let me explain because... Um, we always think as a generation, and I consider myself one generation older than you, mm -hmm. uh, okay. my generation and every generation thinks that it has the responsibility to solve all problems before our kids are, are uh, adults. Yeah. And that's what every parent wants. You want to tell your kids, in the ideal world, don't worry, yeah. I solved it. The, right. the reality is that you cannot. The reality is that our problems are not from yesterday and they will not be solved tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And there will be new problems. 
and the best thing you can do in life is to educate your kids so that they can so back to take the, over so solving our problems. So back to the question, the course needs to be at the University of Amsterdam. Yeah. And, and in about a month, the, then we will see a draft from the Green Deal with education. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, that's not a bad idea. Uh, but it won't, it won't be the most important part of the Green Deals, simply because Brussels doesn't have anything to say about mm -hmm. education. And maybe for the right reasons, by the way, I, I don't want to start that discussion about <laughs> Brussels yes. taking over your life. Th there'll, be, there'll be your second round for questions, so you, your second question can come there. But is there someone else as well that would like to ask a question? Or is that, yeah, because I see that there are more people than... You'll get your turn. That's, uh, we'll, we'll get to you. <laughs> All right. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, so my question sort of relates to this question because according to the IPCC, to reach the 1.5 target, we need negative emissions as well. Yeah. And what we saw in the Fit for 55 package was obviously emission reduction policies. But the, fr um, from my point of view, this lack of uh, incentives for uh, bio CCS, for example. And I heard some rumors that you are, have plans for that, uh, and I would be happy to hear. Yeah, what's this space? 14th of December. We're going to come out with a whole idea, legislative proposals and all kinds of stuff um, about exactly this, about creating negative emissions. Because we should already do that right now to make up for all the emissions that we have. And once we don't have those emissions anymore, the, the removals, the carbon removals, will bring us into negative uh, territory. And that's very positive. Uh, so after 250, when we got to climate neutrality, we should move on. We should reduce the last part of our emissions that we still have in 2050. We are only climate neutral because we compensate yeah. them with carbon removals. And carbon removals is trees or agriculture, ways to sequester carbon into our soil. And we should do that much better than we do right now. Uh, we already have some plans of, about planting trees and, and uh, re, uh, in, well, recreating our forests uh, in terms of quantity and quality, also because of our biodiversity goals. But we should move on with that and also create incentives for farmers to uh, start a complete new <laughs> a, a complete new life. Instead of farming for food, you can still do that, but combine it with farming for carbon sequestration, getting more carbon into the soil. Um, the challenge is how to value that, literally, how to, give, how to create a business case for that, because planting a tree doesn't deliver you any money. You get money when you cut it yeah. mm -hmm. and sell it to somebody else who uses that. That's our business model. We should create a business model for not cutting the tree, which is quite a challenge. Well, uh, some economists we'll in, the, in the room might want to It's quite think interesting. About that. Well, I think we'll get to that because 6% of the green energy in the Netherlands comes from biomass. biomass. Yeah, but so, if, so, you, so if you cut the tree and then set it on fire, uh, you can do that and you mm -hmm. can still argue that well, on, to a, me system level, to on me a system level, you're climate neutral, and you are. But actually, uh, the it problem is that once you cut a tree, yeah, you the worst thing you can do it with it is set it on fire. Yeah. The best thing you can do with it is make things out of it, like this table or a house. Because then it's still, the carbon is still sequestered. The carbon is still not in our atmosphere. If you set it on fire, tomorrow all the CO2 is back yeah, in the Yeah, but air. in the Netherlands, for example, we support that industry with billions. Well, the industry of, yeah, of biomass. Yeah. So, so is that yeah. a stupid decision? or is no. That no, it's not. It's part of our renewable energy. It's not the most, uh, let's say... Every, every energy source, including wind, including solar, has an impact on our ecosystem. Whatever you do, uh, the only way to, to prevent that is stop using energy uh, as mankind. Uh, well, good luck with that. So we, we will have to produce quite some exajoules of energy in the world, and uh, we have to find a mix of energy sources that has the least impact on our ecosystem. Because our ecosystem can stand a blow. We, it, it, planet Earth is quite resilient. Uh, we crossed that boundary, so we are across. Uh, we we are we went further than its natural resilience, and we go. We should go back. But that doesn't mean that we can't do anything anymore, <laughs> including creating an, uh, an, a system where you grow trees and use them. Mm -hmm. uh, because this table will have an end life. 
at a certain point, this table will be thrown away or reused, and you reuse the wood for something else, uh, matches or something like that, or paper. And at the end of that life, something else needs to happen. Turning that into energy at the end of, the, of, of its maximum life is not the worst thing to do. Yes, so you can still do that. But of course, that's not really what happens in, in practice. No, no. I mean. no, but that's the same with uh, if you put windmills in the wrong place, it's a bad idea. Yeah, but then if that's 6% of the 11% that we have in uh, the Netherlands. That's at the moment because that was, the, that was the, cheap, the easy part. But if you look at the, uh, at the growth factors of all the renewable energy in the Netherlands, yeah, it w uh, it the, the other ones are going much faster. Yeah. Actually, at the moment, it's, it's, it's a fun fact. The place in which solar energy grows the most is the Netherlands, at the moment, in, in Europe as mm -hmm. a whole. No. That's a, a, a counterintuitive, I would say. Well, because it cuts expenses and we Dutch people love that, right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you get subsidies and, and then you, you get Dutch people tick, yeah. Uh, we'll get back to the audience uh, in a bit, I think. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, but you had some great yeah, time. but first, um, first of all, you touched upon several topics already, increasing biodiversity, and uh, the Green Deal provides a lot of things. And we made some, uh, yeah, we, we, we summed it up. Uh, healthy air, biodiversity, create jobs, improve public transport, decrease poverty, generate cleaner energy, offer more affordable food, cut emissions by 55%. Uh, in, uh, in 2030 and full cut by 2050. Yeah. And this l list goes on and on and on. Great, eh? Of course, it's <laughs> great. <laughs> yeah. you, you're great, you're great. Yeah, 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 absolutely. It, for me, and I think also for you, Floyd, and maybe also for the audience, it seems like a dream. Yeah. Is it realistic? Yeah, but it, the, 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 the way you present, we, you have to take into account that... I'm not those, framing it. The, no, 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 we, I, I did. Uh, so, yeah, you did. Yeah. But all those beautiful things are at the other side of the mountain. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's our job to climb that mountain. Uh, and that's the difficult part. So reaching the end point is, is great. Actually, everybody is in favor of that. Yeah, uh, sure. But climbing the mountain and, and well, there's always different pathways uh, to, to get to the top of the mountain and then down. And sometimes the downward slope is much more uh, difficult and dangerous. So it's a dangerous or difficult, I should say, path. Uh, uh, path that we need to go. And are, and are there any And that's, paths that's where the story gets less yeah. beautiful. Yeah, beautiful, yeah, <laughs> of course. And are there any paths that, that are too optimistic, in your opinion, within the Green Deal? I might, I might be a little optimist, too optimistic in, in the eyes of many uh, about that pathway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so I think what we can just climb that mountain. Is, is there some step on the pathway where you think they have a point that it is optimistic? Yeah. Uh, obviously, wha where... If you have where to name one concrete one. No, 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 <laughs> but in general, in general, the people that are, think they can climb that mountain, including me, yeah. and including everybody Us, in this room. we also, right? Yeah, well, sorry? We also climbing up the mountain. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. And, and including everybody in this room, uh, highly educated, optimistic life, vision, globalized, etc. All those nice... Uh, I'm looking now in, the, in, in about 50 pairs of eyes with all the opportunities in the world. So for you, it's, it's self-evident that you climb that mountain, and, mm -hmm. and, and I will go with you. Um, but there's a lot of people out here, or not in, not in here, outside of this, for which their life is pretty complicated without me talking about climate change. Um, their life is pretty complicated in terms of reaching the end of the month, yeah. mm -hmm. instead of reaching... 2030 energy poverty. Uh, You're talking about energy poverty. Well, that's not the only part of it, but it's it's part of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and for those people, telling them the nice story, hey, let's climb that mountain, great. Yeah. It's not a very uh, nice proposition. It's not an offer that they can't refuse. It's an offer that they want to refuse. Mm -hmm. And that's where optimism meets reality. Yeah. yeah. And therefore, you drafted also. Uh, you included the social climate fund. Yeah. Within uh, the green deal. Yeah. But. For me, uh, I'm still wondering that are, there are still a lot of people that are in energy poverty. Yeah. Uh, they don't reach the end of the month with all their money. Therefore, the EU, yeah, we included a, a, a big package of uh, funding yeah. to get to isolate their houses or to get a heat pump, for example. Yeah. But still, uh, for me, I think it's not enough because there's a mis mismatch between the EU policy and then the, the people who are really in need of the subsidizing. 
they don't they don't have the capacity to really buy solar panels, for example, and don't get get in the train of energy transition. So how are you as as a former Labour Party making this energy transition more fair? Yeah, that's obviously uh, the the heart of the matter. Yeah. Um, when you th when you look at the Green Deal, and you think what's the difficult part of it? you might tend to think that reaching uh, zero emission cars in 2035 is quite a challenge. Of, yeah. Or even bigger, uh, zero emission steel. Yeah. That's quite mm -hmm. a something almost unimaginable. That's all easy peasy compared to the real challenge, mm -hmm. which is the addressing the social inequalities that will inevitably occur when you make this transition. Because every transition in history of mankind is what you could call Darwinistic. It always ends up with more money and more power in the hands of less people. Yeah. The, en the invention of the steam engine is maybe the best or the worst example of this. All those big transitions, we call them industrial revolutions, and we're now in the fourth mm -hmm. or the fifth, depending <laughs> on how you call or how you count, but all those transitions, industrial revolutions, had one aspect which made it possible to sort of repair the damage of this Darwinistic transition, which is they ended up with triple the amount of wealth that we had before. So we tripled our wealth with the invention of the steam engine. We tripled our wealth with the invention or the transition to mass production, uh, Ford and all the other companies. Mm -hmm. And we again tripled it with automatization and, and computers. And with the Green and, Deal, you want now, to triple it? No, now we don't have that ability anymore. No. We reach the end of, well, you shouldn't say the end, but the slope of our wealth creation is going more gradual than it went in the past, for good reasons, by the way. So we won't have the ability to repair the damage afterwards. Mm -hmm. We have to in include the, the fairness, the justness, into this transition. Yeah. While a transition is almost by definition not fair. It's not equal. And then you, st you, st you talk about, because we have a yeah, also truckload of, of for funds example, and mechanisms to, to make this happen. Yeah, They're and in, in the Netherlands, for example, to give you a small yep. example, the increasing households living in, in energy poverty, it's still increasing, even yeah, in the yeah. Netherlands, a wealthy country. Yeah, yeah, no. And uh, to make this story harder, distributing money is actually the easy part of redistribution. Redistribution of opportunity of capacity. That's the hard part. Mm -hmm. So and when how, I talk about when I fighting energy poverty, if we can't do that, we should really be worried because there's much more difficult redistributional challenges about jobs, about uh, optimism in life, about, as I said, opportunity in life. That's where, that's where the difference is made. That's also where the new segregation in our society is most prominent. It's, mm -hmm. it's not about money, actually. Europe, and especially the Netherlands, has a very or rather equal distribution of income. Mm -hmm. uh, on on uh, wealth, it's a little different, also dependent on how you count. That's not where the, the big problem is. The big problem is the inequality in opportunity. Um, and that's where, uh, the Green Deal, where, where the Green Deal might find its... Uh, and what kind of measure, measurements did you, did you have then? Well, we're still looking. Still we don't, nobody knows exactly. Also, how this also this a missing bit. part in the Euro Green Deal, education. Uh, no, I, yeah. and now well, this education is, is, is the best, it's pre-distribution as we call it. Uh, it's, it's the best way, but it's also the long, it's a long-term uh, strategy mm -hmm. that will not help anybody tomorrow. Uh, and you might want to help some people tomorrow. We have, uh, uh, obviously the whole Green Deal is, is peppered with words like reskilling and upskilling and, and providing opportunity, etc. But the, the true story is, the honest, the honest story is, we don't have a clue. Well, that's not very, well, very no. pleasing to well, hear. I mean, if, if it would be it easy, it, it might be, be that via that, that camera, because you said that <laughs> in this building we are all uh, the lucky ones. But yeah. it might be that yeah, via that are. camera there are some people sitting and mm. watching you and thinking, well, um, I'm quite concerned about this Green Deal. Um, and yeah. then we don't have a clue, it's yeah. maybe... Um, I think it's a fair bet that anybody who's watching this also has the ability in life to make this happen. But okay, no, <laughs> it's actually the people who do not see this. And that's all, do, who you do not reach. Who yeah. mm -hmm. Do not think about politics more than 30 seconds a day. Yeah. And, and those 30 seconds are not the happy 30 seconds of their day. 
<laughs> so, and, and that's that's where real talent is. And yeah. then, all of a sudden, uh, because we all imagine people that we sort of saw on the street or know, hopefully, uh, still. But then move yourself to Bulgaria, in which this this whole challenge reach a new le reaches next level. Uh, and that's where we have to, to address all those. Uh, and, and we're making a dent. We, 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 I think, again, it's the best attempt we ever, uh, we ever made. For instance, with our recovery and resilience facility, mm -hmm. uh, which mm -hmm. is a huge, again, a huge redistributional effort within Europe, where Romania gets 30% uh, of its GDP in terms of this fund. So 30%. So imagine the Netherlands would receive almost 300 billion euros out of the RRF to invest in better schools, in, in, in renewable energy, etc. That's the size that we now uh, give to Romania. Uh, you might worry about the absorption capacity of a country <laughs> to, to invest that money. It's a, almost, you need an almost a World Bank approach within Europe to make this happen. Mm -hmm. uh, but that, so. I'm proud of the attempt that we're making, and I'm, I'm confident that we make the best attempt we ever made. I'm but it's not, not sure sufficient whether it's enough. enough. No, it, I'm no. not sure. Showing no. that we are a rich country uh, in Europe, <laughs> yeah. I think <laughs> sure. yeah. that the Netherlands showed yeah. that lately, uh, because there was still some money on the shelf uh, in Europe. I think it was something like 5.6 billion. Yeah, it's still there. It's still there, right? Yeah. You can uh, still come and get it. it yeah, we were running. We we exactly. Actually, you already <laughs> paid for it. So, yeah. <laughs> so, could you please explain, like, this, this 5.6 billion is it, like it's a, it's a money reserve for the Netherlands. Uh, and we can, just we can pay our student debt from that, right? Right, yeah, exactly. Sure. Uh, and we could even, yes. for everyone in the hall, we could have a quick vote. I think everyone would agree. Um, but is, is, isn't it awkward for you, uh, as, as and for Timmermans, that you are the head of the Green Deal and then the Netherlands still <laughs> handed in, I can, uh, not handed in their worse, plans? If it's even worse, uh, we are also in the part of the very small group of, of commissioners and, and, uh, and uh, civil servants that are the steering board of the RRF. So uh, 750 billion needs to be distributed in accountable and transparent, etc., effective, efficient. So quite a machinery we have within the European Commission to make that happen because we can't fail with this. Uh, this is our hallmark project. So if we fail, we have a big problem. So on top of that machinery, there's a steering board and we are part of that, I'm part of that. And there's always a little chuckle in the room mm -hmm. when they say, oh, we have now 26 plans. There's one missing. <laughs> uh, but to be fair, it's not a big, it's actually, you could see it as a sign of luxury or even decadence that a country can afford well, not to take that money. Quite decadent even. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah. I, I don't know if you uh, receive but Dutch television in, in Brussels. Yeah, yeah, uh, I but, but I, I w As preparing at home, I was watching Buitenhof, uh, and Timmermans was there, yeah. uh, and in the same episode, I think, was uh, the no, Nobel... No, the other episode. It was an episode before yeah, a while. Yeah, then yeah, I, yeah, I yeah. just continued, yeah. but it was uh, Mukwege was sitting yeah. there, the, it, the Nobel Peace Prize president from, uh, from Congo. Yeah. Um, and then I, when I think of a country that might be uh, happy with, with 5.6 billion, I thought, well, yeah. they, they would probably be happy with that. Absolutely. And then they said that they felt more or less, more or less left out of the, of the Green Deal, um, yeah. Because, well, in the production of batteries, they are an important uh, country. Absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. And how do you then? Because when I watched that, I thought, you, you know, one episode with Buitenhof, uh, there's some country in, 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 in Europe that just, you know, leaves money on the shelf, and then there's other ones that feel left out. Yeah. How do you look at that? Well, it's about, obviously, this, this is uh, indeed, it, it, it's a little confrontational for all of us um, to... to where your decadence meets the real needs of the world. Um, and Congo is a very good or a very bad example of that. Um, it's actually the example of where our consumption has an external dimension that we like to forget mm -hmm. about. And uh, that's nothing new. It's not the Green Deal that is the cause of this. It's our consumption that is the cause of it. And it's already happening with oil, gas, minerals all over the world. Cobalt. The, green, then, deal the, adds, the green Deal adds a new dimension to it. Mm -hmm hopefully also subtracts some of it. But then some of it, maybe yeah. something that I don't understand, the, the reason yeah. that he was talking about the Green Deal in particular is that they are producing 70% of the world's supplying of cobalt. 
yeah. Co cobalt is for everyone here, the, the things that we put in batteries. Yeah. Uh, and then you say it has nothing to do with the Green Deal, but of course when no, you... No, that has to do with the Green okay, Deal. Okay, but, but then... it didn't start with the Green Deal. Okay, but, but then produce, still, if I may yeah. finish my yeah, question, yeah, yeah, yeah. then uh, <laughs> the thing is that if you say um, we are going for all electric cars, uh, then you imply that we need batteries, of course, yeah. and then I see mm -hmm. someone sitting at Buitenhof and saying, well, we feel left out. Yeah, that's... that's uh, isn't it a little Eurocentric then in the plan? Absolutely. I mean, yeah, that we can say by are. 2030, we are fit for 55%, yeah. and in 2050, we are climate neutral, but then with the extraction of cobalt in Congo. Isn't it Eurocentric? What kind of measurements if, if do we, you have? If we would end up like that, it would be... Uh, uh, we wouldn't have solved the, the issue. As I said in the beginning, the Green Deal is about putting Europe and with Europe, the rest of the world, on that pathway to, to sustainable future. So Congo included. But I just wanted to address the fact that, indeed, Congo provides 70% of world's uh, cobalt. It provides 90% of world's coal tan. And mm -hmm. that's in this. And that didn't start with the Green Deal. That's where we all profit from every day without even thinking about it. Here in this machine is coal tan. 90% of that coal tan is from Congo or Rwanda with the, the misery that is connected to it. Yeah. Anyway, back to the batteries. Um, the, the objective that we have is not only to have more batteries in Europe, but also, first of all, uh, to recycle them fully for 100%, not 90, not 95, not 99, not 99.9, .9, but 100% of it, which, is, uh, which will help this problem. The second is, which will really help the problem, but then Congo has a dilemma to face. We shouldn't need cobalt for batteries. The mm -hmm. next generation of batteries is the so-called solid state battery, which by the way also gives you a range of 700 miles, but also uh, doesn't use the rare, the rare materials that we need for the current lithium batteries that we have. This is not only a solution for Congo, because all of a sudden nobody wants their cobalt anymore. No. So, Every challenge is always, when you solve a problem, as you know, as a student, you always Creating open a new another. door and yeah. find a new one. Uh, and that never ends. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we need but to, that, that's we need to one, include right? also uh, uh, Congo in our sustainability mm -hmm. uh, objective, not only from an environmental point of view, but also an economical point of view. Yeah. How to make... And that, that's a whole new room for discussion and for next, uh, next week. Uh, <laughs> there's, there's loads of people you can invite on that who could speak on that with much more gravity than I can. But how to create a sustainable economy for Congo. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, for sure. We, we have to invite someone to, to discuss that. Which, by the way, will have a, a, a capital, um, Kinshasa, um, that has 70 million inhabitants, seven zero million, so 70 million inhabitants in the second half of this century. Mm -hmm. And by the way, Lagos will have 80 million. There's a whole continent south of Europe uh, that we haven't invited to our party. Uh, they invite themselves, uh, meanwhile, and justifiably so, and there, there will be two and a half billion people looking for wealth, looking for prosperity, looking for opportunity. That's a challenge. Yeah, but do, do you, as, as the EU, feel responsible for also the, the things that happen at the cobalt yeah. mines, yeah. Uh, child abuse, abuses and human yeah. rights, Absolutely. for example? Absolutely. And have you had, do you have any measurements to yeah. tackle that? Well, uh, I already announced on the 14th of December, but on the same date, we will come out with uh, legislative proposals that, are, um, that we, under the header of the so-called sustainable corporate governance, where we introduce due diligence into our corporate governance uh, framework. Mm -hmm. And that will, that will include, I should say, an attempt, because I don't know how far we get, but an attempt to make the company dealing with these materials like, like responsible in, in for Germany, what happens. In Germany already, uh, Germany already, they have addressed it. Yep. But then it goes on that um, the, the, the company that buys it, then they have the, the first company that they buy it from, yep. only and there then, it applies. And, and then it stops. But that, that's, that's, that's nothing, right? Then you only apply it to one company because the problem is... It's not is nothing. It's not enough. It's not, not enough. Nothing. It's a step forward. And so far, we haven't done anything. Mm -hmm. When we get to the fifth subcontractor, we got a long way. Yeah. And we're still not there because I, you know what, what companies will do. They will get a sixth one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you are responsible up to the fifth, 
uh, get a six one, dump all this stuff there, and you're fine. Uh, so it's, as I said, it's an internal challenge, an eternal one. And we can't solve that here, and we can't, I, I, I don't think we will solve it in our mandate, which ends in 2024, but we can get a long way. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, um, I promised one gentleman, for example, that I would come back. I think it's, it would be great to uh, uh, come back to the audience for a second and see if uh, there might be someone with a lot of knowledge on cobalt or something else. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, first of all, the gentleman over here that I promised to, uh, to give the, the microphone once more. Only one question, but that's... Uh, Clear. Thank you very much for your promise. No uh, first of all, I hope I can count on your support for my uh, proposal on the education uh, part. Uh, I will reach out. Does it make a difference? But uh, if it does, <laughs> it yes. does. It definitely <laughs> does. Uh, and then I would like to ask a question from my fellow climate ambassador: Is uh, how do you how does the Fit for 55 package involve the youth? Uh, because, yeah, I think it's important as well. Yeah, I know, and, and, and I, I like that question, um, and I think you should be eager to be involved, but not formally. You should not ask for a formal spot on the table. As soon as you have a formal spot on the table, it's dead in the water. So uh, your, your contribution is actually much more valuable uh, in the informal, chaotic, aggressive, assertive way that you have at the moment. I, I dare to say that the Green Deal is only there because of youth. Um, much different than my generation, your generation is looking for purpose um, in many ways, uh, asking for it too, by the way. And just to tell you uh, um, what I experienced in the last one and a half year. In the last one and a half year, building the Green Deal I spoke to a lot of people who think they are very important, uh, and sometimes they are. Uh, so high civil servants, CEOs of big companies, government leaders, ministers. And in all those conversations, and that's different from the past, at some point it turns to their own children. And it's about th those children asking questions, small ones about eating meat, uh, bigger ones about flying to Bali on holiday, but also existential ones. Hey, Dad, what are you doing to save my future? And if that father happens to be the CEO of Daimler-Benz, it's quite an existential question. <laughs> and I can tell you that for Daimler-Benz, a bad shareholders meeting is a bad day. Or a bad headline about Dieselgate is a bad day. But not being able to give that answer to your own children, that's much more than a bad day. And I, I dare to say that that is a much more important factor in how things change than we think. So it's not only by voting and democracy in the formal way, it's also just the kitchen table at home. So um, I have to compliment and applaud your generation for being so different than my generation. Because I studied in the, in the party years of the 90s, uh, I, I finished my Masters in 1994, which was in the, in the boom of the economy. And at that time, you could have your application, uh, your, your interview for a, your job interview, in the showroom of the car dealer. So that you could leave after your job interview with your newest lease wagon, your newest lease car, you could leave. And almost all of us fell for it. Shell, McKinsey, they were the biggest... Uh, they, were, they have, were, have, were having the biggest success in recruiting young talent. No. Tell you mm -hmm. what, Shell doesn't get any new talent anymore. That's their biggest problem. It's not about not being able to get enough oil out of the ground or the oil price being too low or too high, whatever it is. Nowadays, their biggest problem is that young talent doesn't want to work there anymore. Well, before we move to the next one, of course, anyway. I, I have to ask you then, what are you doing? Because if, if that's the question on the kitchen table, what are you doing? I'm, I'm, I'm Personally. trying to, to make a green deal happen. Did you fly to uh, Glasgow? No, no, no. I, I, we will take the train. Okay. okay. <laughs> but that's, uh, that's almost too easy. Yeah, yeah. of course. That's, yeah. a, that's the same point. Because like, we, know like everybody, we know everybody will ask us, so we take yeah. the train. Yeah, of course. The, the real <laughs> test is when nobody asks and nobody looks, do you take the train? Well, how did and you arrive real, here the at this interview? Is, we too little, we do. How did you arrive at this interview? with my electrical ID3 Volkswagen. <laughs> okay, <laughs> great, yeah. Okay, great answer. The one in the back there, yeah. 
Thank you. Uh, Mr. Samson, earlier uh, during this discussion, you meant, uh, mentioned China's contribution to uh, climate change and climate policy. Um, and there's actually an ongoing process of replacing its coal usage with gas uh, and especially nuclear reactors. Yeah. Uh, 50 of them are planned in the coming 10 years. Um, I personally think and hope uh, that one of the main outcomes of COP26 will be the inclusion of nuclear energy to the U uh, EU green taxonomy. Uh, and I was wondering, especially regarding your background, uh, academic background as a nuclear physicist, uh, what your opinion would be of, uh, on this? Yeah, it's interesting because um, I might share that hope with you, not, not formally about being part of the taxonomy. We shouldn't bother the room with, with the technical discussions about the taxonomy, but um, if nuclear can make a difference for a sustainable future, it would be great. I already talked about Kinshasa having 70 million inhabitants. It's almost unimaginable to power such a heap of people uh, in a clean way without polluting the air or climate you, uh, using solar panels. It's, it's possible, but it's quite cumbersome. If we would develop the fourth generation nuclear energy, which are uh, small modular reactors based on thorium, you get rid of, I shouldn't say all, but most of the problems that are connected to safety and waste, you don't have CO2 emissions, it will be great. The problem at today is that those reactors deliver power at a price of about one euro per kilowatt hour, which is 100 times more expensive than solar energy. So we're not there yet. But if you are an optimist about technology, and I am as an engineer, you can't be selective. You can't say, oh, we will make it with solar and wind and nuclear will not go anywhere. No, nuclear might go somewhere. And maybe China wants to deliver a give a contribution to that. I, I don't know. In Europe, I'm not sure, because we can solve our problems. We, we got a long way, also with nuclear, by the way. Uh, we got a long way to the place where we are right now, and we can see, in practical terms, we can see a fully renewable energy system for Europe without using nuclear energy. But that truth is not true for the rest of the world. And maybe not even for Europe, by the way. Mm -hmm. I can't exclude any option, and we shouldn't. But we should, we should be vigilant about creating new lock-ins in new mistakes. And I'm not confident, but, uh, because nothing is black and white here, but I do think that the, the current generation of nuclear energy has too many downsides to just spread it around. Um, would you be in favor of nuclear energy in, in, in the EU? If, if the fourth generation is, uh, and it's actually possible, it's not just theoretical, it's not even just on a lab scale. We build them in the 60s already. Mm -hmm. uh, but the problem was you couldn't make a nuclear weapon out yeah. of it. So uh, lots of countries lost their interest because, well, uh, <laughs> there were more important things in life, in <laughs> geopolitics, making that nuclear weapon. But if we pick that up again and we, and we could develop it into the right direction and with smart kids and smart new generations and uh, people that are smarter than I am, at least, uh, we might get that. No, but I think that's a better answer because the last time I heard Timmerman saying that he said that there was just no business case. Um, this is a but more. That, that's no, a more but that's that's, that's well, also true because at the moment there's no business case for nuclear. Yeah, but then the the explanation that goes with it right now is is I think stronger because just no business case. I mean, as a politician, you could of course also create a create business it. case. Yeah. So so this is what you know. The answer now is more elaborate. So if, if we yeah, but, but improve in technology, but politicians then are also required to use taxpayers' money wisely. And our subsidy scheme was preached. Every subsidy is is by default stupid, eh? uh, because yeah, in natural you, yeah. you always have uh, subsidies mm -hmm. only work if you give too much. Um, because well, if you give too little, nothing happens, and giving exactly the right amount is impossible. So you always give too much. But we have designed our systems and we have calibrated them and developed them. So we work now with, for economists, it's, this should be understandable, with contracts for difference, where we give the smallest possible subsidy to the energy source that is almost the most competitive of all. So nuclear is in the back of the road there. No. If we would artificially put nuclear in front of the row and subsidize it, uh, well, to the maximum amount, I think we will be under scrutiny of our taxpayers saying, hey, you're throwing all that money at a very expensive energy source while there's more, more cheap 
renewable energy source available. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's, that's where, so it's always that uh, relay of innovation, government policy, new innovation, government policy. And I think innovation now has a bigger role to play in nuclear. Clear. Uh, is there someone you would like to point out in the audience? Mr. Samson? No, 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 just, I leave that to you, <laughs> okay. otherwise I get in trouble uh, over here. Over here, <laughs> the gentleman in front, over here. Yeah. Okay. If you say so, Renze. Of right? course. Yeah. And then I, <laughs> I won't interrupt for you. <laughs> now she needs to walk because of you. Thank you. That's yeah. Fine. Yeah, so regarding the uh, rare earth minerals, a uh, significant percentage come from China. You also mentioned the important role of China but at the same time, we see that the United States and Europe are ramping up uh, geopolitical tensions with China. So how can we expect to cooperate with China at the same time that we're you know, trying to fight with them? In a yeah, that's a difficult one. Actually, uh, to be more nuanced, uh, the US is ramping up its geopolitical tensions with China. We are ramping up our humanitarian tensions with China. And I think for good reasons. Uh, so the way China operates, uh, with the Uyghurs uh, and also mm -hmm. with the environment, by the way, requires a conversation. Within that conversation, it should be possible to make progress. That's the hard truth of international diplomacy, that you shake hands or give a, fi uh, a fist bump uh, to, with people that you do not agree with big time. Mm -hmm. And China is such a person. I'm a bit worried about US-China because their geopolitical tensions have a more structural character, a uh, more competitive character, um, but the role of the EU is different. And we see ourselves, and you will watch it next week, in, uh, you will see it next week in Glasgow, we will, the, the EU positions itself in that triangle. So not on the, on the spot where the US is, not where China is, but on its own position. As a, media trying as to a mediator between... It's a, yeah, it's a bit of a different role, but you could, you could argue that it's a sort of a mediating role. There's many more angles to watch, obviously, the developing nations, the small island states. The good part of the UNFCCC, yeah, that's the treaty that we're talking about in, in the conference of the parties, COP26 in Glasgow. This day. The, the, the beauty of the UNFCCC is that it's the, the only treaty within the UN framework where one country, one vote is really true. Vanuatu can make a difference in the plenary session of the UNFCCC. Well, I challenge you to watch that at the WTO or wherever <laughs> in the international diplomacy. Vanuatu can make, and why? Because Vanuatu is the for, first country to disappear because of climate change. And that gives them that, that weight that they don't have at any other table and that makes the UNFCCC a more, a more progressive institution. And, and, yeah. I, and I know all the critics about the circus and the complexity and the, the inertia of it, but actually it's the best attempt mankind ever made to create a world community. Yeah. Okay, well, um, I think looking at the clock right now, I'm, I'm so sorry for the, for the questions still in the audience, but that we, I think we'll have to have wrap up. There was one question up front that you really wanted to ask, so I'll give that to you, Hans. No, I think also you, as a, as a younger generation, you also have uh, this burning question, I guess. Uh, we discussed the Green Deal and that it depends on uh, the behavior of its member states, externalities as gas, gas pricing fluctuating. And as a younger generation, do we have to be pessimistic about our future of the climate. No. No? no. Why not? Because he's in Brussels. Uh, <laughs> no. No, no, no. Because we will solve at least part of it and leave most of it to you. Uh, but you will be able to do that. Uh, I'm confident. If you, if you watch the last decade, because if you had asked me this question the last time I was here, which is a decade ago, yeah. which was traumatic, uh, <laughs> to be honest, uh, was in the midst of, uh, well, the... the was before the elections of 2012, and then I got burned for not being uh, uh, for not complying with austerity. The whole room was shouting at the L Dutch Labour Party for being careful about austerity. So we had to comply with the three percent government 
deficit rules of Europe. All the students were shouting out. Anyway, <laughs> you can see traumatic, traumatic experience. Traumatic. I, I'm still not over. <laughs> but, but back to after the question. That, yeah. After that, <laughs> another decade started. And that, this, this last decade is amazing in terms of innovation, in terms of technology, and I already said in terms of the new generation. And those, those new elements, those new ingredients, will shape a different future. Um, so we still stand a chance, uh, and you are going to, to make that happen. You, you're not just idle bystanders, you're not commentators, you're part of it. If you contribute to, to that solution, I'm, I'm confident that we will have that sustainable future. Well, Mr. Samson, thank you very much. I hope this version was a little less uh, traumatic than the, <laughs> than the last one. Yeah, uh, thank you all very, very much for coming. Thank you. Uh, give it up for Mr. Samson. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you.